Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for diversity in commercial real estate, barriers and opportunities. I'm Quincy Enoch, and I will be the moderator today. I work for Invariant, a government affairs and public relations firm. I spent the last 14 years working on policy in the financial services sector. I'm extremely excited to be here today to talk about the commercial real estate industry. Like many industries, commercial real estate does not reflect the diversity of America. Few African Americans even view the in industry as a viable career option. This is in large part due to both real and perceived barriers to entry. Today, we will examine the issues that have led to the lack of diversity in the industry to see if we can begin to break down those barriers and make commercial real estate a feasible choice for more African Americans. To help us dig into this topic today, we are fortunate to have a couple of great panelists with us. First, representing the National Association of Realtors, we have Moses Hall. Moses is the owner operator of Mohall Commercial and Urban Development, a full service commercial real estate brokerage specializing in investment sales, retail sales and leasing, multifamily and mixed use sales, office leasing and sales, and ground up development. Moses has been in the commercial real estate industry for seven years and has become a go-to realtor in the Chicago commercial real estate market. Next, we have John Jones. John serves as Vice President of Government Affairs for NARI, the National Association of Real Estate Trusts. Prior to joining NARI, John served on Capitol Hill for 15 years, where he worked as a Chief of Staff to a senior member of Congress that served on the House Financial Services. Thank you both for joining us. We would love to hear some opening remarks and your thoughts about the commercial real estate industry. Let's start with Moses. Hey, Quincy, thank you so much for this opportunity. I believe that this is a much needed conversation in our industry. Being a commercial real estate broker here in the Chicagoland area, I've noticed there's been a lot of barriers to achieve the goals that I wanted to see in the neighborhoods that I work in. Uh, I was fortunate enough to discover certain programs such as Project REIT, which is a program uh, that helps minority professionals enter the commercial real estate world. Based on NAR's uh, data and statistics, uh, the average commercial member is 60 years old. I got into this industry at the age of 23 and the gross household income of a commercial member is over 165,000 a year. So that right there being a minority trying to enter a, a field where the barrier of network is there, also cost is there. Um, it's definitely been a challenge for me to be an entrepreneur and break into that field. So I, I definitely appreciate having these type of conversations that we can see more minorities in this space, that we can show other people that there's opportunities to be successful in this space and uh, I think we need to create more conversations and opportunities about this subject matter. Oh, that's great. Um, really appreciate you having you here. Um, I think having some firsthand knowledge of somebody in the industry is going to be uh, very helpful for those watching the panel. Uh, John, I wanna to turn to you as a representative uh, of the real estate industry, uh, you having kind of a uh, uh, 30,000 foot level view of the industry overall. Absolutely. Uh, number one, thank you uh, for hosting this very important panel on this very important topic. Um, my uh, background in real estate, I would say was first, first sparked as a, a young uh, boy living in my neighborhood and seeing it in, in the neighborhood that I lived, uh, there were a number of uh, rental households and every uh, third Sunday of the month, it seemed all the landlords uh, came out to collect checks or to do lawn work and so forth. I remember asking my uh, father, who are these folks that are coming in uh, the neighborhood to collect checks and do work? And he said, those are, those are the landlords. And I got a pretty good understanding of the landlord-tenant uh, relationship. And I come, came to understand that it was far better to be the landlord than, than to be the tenant. Uh, working uh, for 15 years on Capitol Hill, working in the House and, and the U.S. Senate, 
uh, I was fortunate because every member that I worked for served on the banking or financial services committee, which uh, those are committees that have a large uh, degree of oversight over the real estate industry. And uh, that sparked a interest in real estate for me from a policy uh, uh, perspective. And then I went back to school uh, at night to get my MBA where I focused on real estate finance. And uh, now in uh, my work working for NARI, which uh, is the, as Quincy said, the worldwide represented voice for REITs. REITs are real estate investment trust. Uh, we represent about almost 200 publicly held, mostly publicly held real estate companies. REITs are kind of a niche issue, goes back to 1960, signed into law by one President Eisenhower, passed by Congress, um, and it's a diverse, diverse portfolio, everything from shopping malls to health centers, to cell towers, to warehouses, <clears throat> uh, to hospital centers. Um, and this opportunity working at Nayarit has been really interesting just because it's, an, it's a trying time in commercial real estate, but it's an exciting time as well. And I'm always uh, interested personally and professionally to see where technology intersects with real estate. I think a lot of interesting things are happening in that regard. And um, a really important challenge that we have to find a way to address and uh, solve the challenges as it pertains to the lack, the lack of African-American diversity in the commercial real estate space. We have a lot of work to do uh, on our end uh, within industry. I think some of the biggest challenges we have is that in order to many cases get into the real estate industry on the commercial side and then thrive in that industry once you're in. It's very much dependent on relationships, uh, capital, access to capital, and exposure. Uh, so these are barriers, quite frankly, that have uh, uh, in many ways blocked African-American uh, access for, for, for decades um, in this country. But I think with the attention that's Given to the challenges today, we have some real opportunities to make some improvements. So happy to be here uh, with you all today and uh, looking forward to talking about some of the solutions um, that we could uh, raise and highlight to deal with the challenges before us. Well, thank you, John. Thank you both for being here today. The commercial real estate industry is not something that gets me um, you know, I think that especially in our communities, um, you know, we don't really focus on it. I don't think that many of us have an understanding of how to get into it or even what it entails. And so, you know, you don't have a lot of people aspiring. Moses, I salute you um, for uh, being a young entrepreneur that, you know, was fearless and uh, trying to enter this industry. Um, and the role that you played in the success you've had, I think, has been great. And John, I think you really spoke to um, a couple of the barriers that we saw there. Um, and wanna dig into that a little bit more. So Moses, I wanna turn to you um, just to kind of get your experience a little bit. You know, there is a clear lack of diversity in the commercial real estate space, as I'm sure you um, know all too well. Um, what, what, what was the biggest barrier or obstacle for you um, getting into the business, and then once you were in, what 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 were some of the other obstacles you had to overcome to attain some success? Well, one of the first barriers of getting into this industry is exposure to knowledge. You know, uh, commercial real estate is d definitely different from residential real estate, and there's a, a lack of courses that you can take to, you know, fulfill your knowledge in order to conduct day-to-day -day transactions. So as I kind of mentioned in my introduction, I kind of started with uh, a program called Project REIT. It's a minority uh, commercial real estate program that exposes you to the industry of different uh, factors and assets classes um, in, the, in this particular field. So it's about like a three month course and they bring in different industry professionals from all over to teach us about multifamily, retail, industrial, REITs, all these different things. So that was kind of my first exposure to it. And from there, I kind of launched to take in CCIM courses uh, to further my knowledge about commercial real estate. Uh, so one, one of the, like you said, that's one um, 
aspect of it is the knowledge, how to conduct and understand commercial real estate investments. Then the next aspect of it is the network. As I kind of mentioned uh, as well, that the average commercial member is 60 years old and their gross household income is over 165,000. So when you have someone like that, they typically run with other people that, you know, make 165,000 and then they know other business owners, they know other uh, investors. The average black uh, household income based on the Census Bureau was 41,000. Our home ownership rate is 44%, which is the same as it was when it was legal to discriminate against Blacks. And so we have a, uh, a lack of access to capital issue. We have a, a lack of access to network to be in these types of uh, conversations and rooms. And so I've been able to kind of move, maneuver around those type of issues, being a part of uh, NAR, other local organizations that put me in these rooms where I'm typically the only Black African-American individual in the room but it allows me and puts me in a position to conduct business, gain new clients, gain insight, you know, and understand what's going on. So kind of what John mentioned, uh, I think we, we have a, a, an issue of network, capital and access to capital. And those are some of the barriers that I've experienced just even uh, running a brokerage, some of the tools and resources that I have to uh, use on a day-to-day -day basis for research purposes these tools cost thousands of dollars a month. Being a you know, boutique brokerage trying to foot the bill so that I can be on the same level playing field as the big name brokerages. So something like that is definitely some of the challenges that I face in a day-to-day -day, uh, operation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine. Um, you know, you're a good brother uh, for doing it and helping pave the way. I think whenever we have um, uh, good young African-Americans like yourself out there trailblazing in some of these industries, really uh, your story is going to resonate with a lot of people. Because like you said, often if you're going to talk about commercial real estate, you're getting somebody that's a lot older with a lot more money. Um, so really salute you and appreciate you uh, once again. Uh, because I think that it will show a whole bunch of others that it's a possible opportunity for them. Right. Uh, John, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, some of the barriers coming in. Just want to give you an opportunity to uh, expound on that a little bit and, you know, ask you if you see any um, institutional type of barriers, you know, for the industry overall um or do you think it's you know more um would you say that some of the barriers are just as on the individual level not having this knowledge not having this information or do you think there's something a little bit more where institutionally you know african americans are kind of kept on the sideline and, and out of this industry sure well um you know with me i've had a background in politics and policy and so forth. So I tend to look, think, look at issues from the historical policy perspective. And if you look at the challenges in this country in which in many states where at some point in time, it was illegal for African-Americans to hold land. And then you go into the 1930s, <clears throat> early 1940s, post-World War II, uh, post-depression uh, with FDR, President Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt establishing the FAA and basically allowing opportunities for the middle class and the working class to uh, become homeowners and to build those nest eggs, uh, to send their children to college, to gain home equity. Uh, because of redlining, African-Americans uh, across the board were barred from, from a large amount of these opportunities to actually purchase uh, their own home, uh, forbidden from the opportunity to actually obtain a loan to purchase their own home. So that is, uh, uh, systemic corrective measures were in, were put in place in the 1960s, effectively banning redlining. But it still reared its ugly head in many ways, and the effects of redlining uh, actually exist to this very day. So systemically, the challenges are there, and I look at the uh, uh, the policy issues that can be utilized to address this. So 
one of which is something that uh, we have at NAREED is the Div Dividends Through Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, where we seek to identify and help and assist African American and other minorities and females to actually uh, rise and uh, seek senior level opportunities in the uh, REIT industry. Uh, in terms of policy, HR 5084, the Improving Corporate Governance Through Diversity Act. This was a bill that was passed out of the, the democratically controlled uh, House of Representatives, supported by Congressman Greg Meeks of New York, <clears throat> Carolyn Maloney, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney of New York, and Chairwoman uh, Maxine Waters of the Financial Services Committee, where this is a bill that actually I, requires firms uh, to identify uh, minorities, African Americans, uh, women, ethnic minorities who actually make up their leadership position. So that's pressure from the policy angle, something like that. Uh, I look at that as uh, incremental solutions that help to address the issue. Individually, uh, look, uh, when I, much like Moses, when I step into a room, uh, a real estate room, so to speak, uh, when we're discussing corporate real estate issues, in many cases, I am uh, the only uh, African American. Um, and I look at this situation with the understanding that there may be some who say, well, look, notwithstanding his academic qualifications, not this, not uh, withstanding his uh, uh, professional resume, he is checking a box. And that won't be everyone's uh, interpretation or understanding or assumption, but that assumption will be there among some. And my goal is always to step into a position with the understanding that I am maximizing this role uh, to the best of my ability, that my work performance will dramatically exceed that of someone who was coming from central casting, and that the performance that I'm going to provide uh, as a subject matter expert who can speak to the uh, policy issues impacting uh, real estate and the future of real estate policy, um, I am going to add substance uh, to the conversation. And I think uh, that's a challenge that's incumbent on all of us to basically understand that as uh, African Americans, we have to exceed the expe expectations that are out there, not to please or to uh, accommodate uh, uh, perhaps naysayers uh, in the room, but to set the example for other African Americans, especially younger African Americans that are gonna, going to uh, come after us. So I think it's incumbent upon us, and I see this with Moses and with Quincy, to demonstrate uh, every day within the world of, uh, of real estate that we are working to become experts in our craft, whether that's going to be on the commercial side, that's going to be on the policy side, that's going to be the, on the investment or financing side, as we are demonstrating that we are experts in our craft, uh, we will um, you know, uh, nullify any false assumptions that are out there over time. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think it's critically important that we are uh, working regularly to make sure we're setting that good example. I think it's uh, unfortunately one of the additional burdens that we carry because um, how we perform um, certainly will lead to uh, or help determine what other opportunities are out there for other African-Americans that come before us. If we mess it up, it's gonna be harder for them to get in the door. And if we excel, um, we might uh, create a situation where now some of those naysayers, as you put it, John, might say, hey, we just need to give this guy a chance off the break because um, you know, we've, we've had experiences with people of color before and, come, and they come in here and they're working hard and they're exhibiting the excellence that everybody wants to see. Um, you know, just kind of uh, speaking to that, I, I think that was a great, um, you know, uh, kind of topic that you got into, John, in terms of being uh, the only African American in the room uh, when you're in one of these uh, real estate rooms. I would just um, ask Moses, in your experience, being the only African American in that room, um, you know, what has been uh, your reception? Um, you know, what, 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 how have people treated you? How have, you know, your initial interactions gone? Uh, things of that nature when you are working with others um, in the real estate industry. 
because I know as a man of color, you're going to have to deal with it, but you're also a little bit younger too. So you probably have to deal with, you know, look at the young buck over here. Um, right. And so just if you could speak to some of those experiences, uh, uh, we'd love to hear. It. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that I try to be conscious of and mindful of is my appearance. When I walk into these rooms, I know that I naturally already stand out. So I also try to add to that and be dressed very well <laughs> that because people perception is like you said, before you open your mouth, the first thing people are going to notice is how you look. So I try to look presentable at all times in these rooms because, like you said, I have to be an overachiever. There's going to be a level of expectation as an African-American that I have to outperform my, my other counterparts. So walking into these rooms, I'm, it's always noticed that I'm well-dressed. When I open my mouth, and I actually know what I'm talking about, as John said, an expert in the field because I've spent countless hours, I've spent countless money in training, and being out in the field and learning how to conduct these deals. So overall, I've had a good experience. It hasn't been an experience where I felt kind of shunned. And typically in these rooms, I know at least one individual. And that one individual will vouch for me and say, hey, this is, this is Mo, Mo Hall. This is Moses Hall. Man, he's the next guy. And then it'll make everyone else in the room feel a little bit comfortable in engaging with me and talking with me. So I've had those opportunities where someone will vouch for me and then the rest of the room will kind of open up. So, but like I said, to the point of, as an African-American, you have no room to slack. You have to be 100% on all fronts, whether the way you dress, your knowledge, your professionalism. You know, I, I got into this industry to improve communities. So I work heavily on the South and West sides of Chicago, which are underserved communities. A lot of times there are brokers that just take on these listings and they don't put any effort in there. Owners are, you know, uh, underwater, tired, and the brokers they hired are not putting any effort into selling their properties because it is an underserved community. I get the call, I get activity, I get offers, multiple offers within a week of listing because like you said, I give 100% in everything that I do. I have no room to slack. And so that's kind of um, my experience. But overall, I've had decent experiences in these rooms. And like you said, I stand out like a sore thumb, not only because I'm African-American, but also because I'm young. And so I try to use those relationships to kind of get me to that next level. And being involved in leadership positions has definitely kind of uh, sealed my place within the industry when they can see that you serve and you're on a board of directors of this and you're not just a number count but that you add to the conversation that you move the industry forward that definitely helps solidify my place in the industry that is uh, wonderful um, you know it's great to hear that and great to hear you know that if you put everything you have into it um, if you look the part and play the part well, um, that you can be embraced and that, um, that you can succeed and people can begin to view you as a professional, um, as opposed to just uh, an uh, African-American checking the box, as John said, or, uh, you know, a young guy that's, you know, in over his head or, or whatever have you. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about too, just because I think this might be one of those barriers we were talking about, yeah. is the education um, needed to do well in this industry. I think that, you know, and, and in, the, in, in thinking about education, I also want to think about the path, right? So yeah. what does that look like? You have to, you know, I think you want to go to, you know, you go to school, you're in high school, you graduate, um, some people go to college, some people chose, choose not to do that route. Um, you know, what are, you know, the educational steps someone should take if they are interested in the commercial real estate market? Well, actually, I always had a passion for real estate, even in high school. Uh, and I do have a background in the arts, so I do play piano. I come from an arts background. I have a degree in music business, but initially... I was looking to get into real estate at the age of 18. However, when I had graduated high school, that's when we had the largest economic uh, crash and meltdown in 2008. So I put that pursue for real estate on hold, but I do know now that being in the industry, 
Uh, there are certain universities here in Chicago, like Roosevelt University, that has a program, a real estate uh, degree program that you can go and learn about all uh, aspects of the industry. But for me, what my journey looked like getting into the industry, I got into this industry at the age of 23. Uh, prior to uh, getting into real estate, I operated an event space uh, in downtown Chicago. And uh, I started doing the math on what I was paying on this commercial space. And the uh, landlord wanted to raise the rent and a few other things that were happening that uh, elevated me to looking at other spaces. And I started doing the math of what the landlord purchased the building for and what I was paying in rent, what other tenants were paying for rent. And kind of like what John said as a kid, I was like, man, I need to be on the other side of the table and be a landlord owner. And so I knew at the age of 23, I just couldn't go out there and buy a commercial building. So I thought the route to go to actually learn about the industry was starting at the broker route. And so I went and got my real estate license, became a realtor member. The firm that I initially joined was more so a residential firm, but I was the commercial guy. And my managing broker at the time told me he would teach me what he could. And after I got to a certain point, I moved my license to a more full service commercial brokerage. And from there, I really started to learn how to do lease negotiations, this and all that type of stuff. And once I felt comfortable enough, I felt like it was the time for me to start my own brokerage. And when I, you know, in between those times, I did programs like uh, Project REAP. Like I said, it's a, a commercial real estate program that helps minority professionals get into the industry. I also took classes at my local uh, Chicago Association of Realtors and also did CCIM, which is a Certified Commercial Investment Member. I am halfway through the courses for the certification, but back to what we kind of discussed earlier, there is a cost barrier to, to get into these classes and get that education. It is very costly and expensive to go that route. But so that's kind of what my route was. It was field experience, being trained under those uh, that had more experience and then also taking formal classes such as programs such as Project REAP and uh, programs like CCIM. Now that's great. I think um, hearing that path and that story, um, I think is important for a lot of people that you know will have a chance to tune in because um, I think there's some people that are on certain paths right now or involved in certain things and they have jobs and not necessarily careers. Correct. Looking for careers. So I think to hear your story as to you didn't go straight, you know, kind of on a trajectory where you went straight into real estate, you oh. were doing something <laughs> else. Yeah. Uh, you know, you found your way. Uh, I think that's a powerful story um, that, that can go a long way um, in that. John, just want to want to want to hear from you and, and, and see if you'd like to chime in kind of on that education piece. Um, you know, you, you're, you have an educational background, you know, in, in this space. And so just want to hear from you what you think in terms of educational opportunities, what some of the paths look like. And then um, if you could just kind of describe what your, um, what your situation was as you were obtaining your education in this field, what was the level of diversity um, you know, what was the level of encouragement as, as an African-American? It's a great question. Uh, number one, when you look at the educational challenges as it pertains to real estate, I think it's very important. Uh, and this is being done in some quarters at some uh, uh, colleges. I'm a, I, I obtained my undergrad from uh, Clark Atlanta University, uh, historically black college university in Atlanta, Georgia. And I think it's incumbent upon us to basically uh, to stress with HBCUs and with uh, non-HBCU educational institutions the importance of, uh, of providing educational opportunities uh, in real estate fields. And that's everything from accounting, tax law, architecture, finance, urban planning, and appraisal. Um, you know, real estate is a diverse portfolio with diverse opportunities out there. It's important that we uh, work to ensure that you have these programs, not just at the college, but at the high school level as well. And that we're getting young African-American 
exposed to all the different fields and exciting fields within real estate as early as possible. So that's on the prog programmatic level uh, as it pertains to curriculum and also uh, having folks like uh, 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 Moses and other real estate professionals um, so Moses does is already going into classrooms and going into spaces where he's actually uh, where folks are actually speaking to young professionals, young students. Uh, Moses highlighted his uh, program that works to get African Americans into commercial real estate and something where ideas and and programs like that are being replicated across the board, but starting in the classroom, much like today when we talk about uh, automation and technology and how. Our, our, our economy is being digitized. With that, we have to have a whole new curriculum, right? And that also speaks to real estate as well, where we're working, we have to work to get students at a young age connected and educated uh, in all of the different specializations that speaks to real estate. Um, me personally, <clears throat> to your second question, working, um, you know, in, you know, going back to school to get my uh, MBA in real estate finance, I was, within my program, the only African um, American male, while at the same time, I was also with a cohort of students who were studying business for the first time, uh, essentially. So everyone was starting, uh, everyone was at point A in, in, in many ways, right? Uh, but one thing that I wanted to do um, is basically focus on that intersection of uh, real estate and technology, because no matter what field you're in, whether it's, in, you know, whether it's uh, say law, the best lawyers are in the courtroom, but there are also folks who are there are also legal experts who are looking at at how technology is changing their, their industry uh, through AI and smart contracting and so forth. The best doctors or the best surgeons are performing surgery, but you also have health professionals who are looking at how technology is changing healthcare across the board and you look at what's happening uh, today in terms of uh, COVID and how it disproportionately is affecting African-Americans and African-American owned businesses as well. But you look at what's happening in terms of uh, uh, technology, whereas um, in you know senior homes and such, you have the use of telehealth uh, uh, technology. In apartment buildings, there because students are working virtually, you're having uh, spaces laid out and designed differently to accommodate these type of changes that are happening via technology in uh, real estate. Uh, working with NARI, it's a very diverse portfolio. So with folks working, uh, spending uh, more time, not necessarily shopping as much, shopping, shopping in a physical sense, but shopping online, well, that means warehouses are very, very busy this day and age. And that is something that is part of the real estate portfolio and the changes that are going through in terms of technology in these warehouses. When you look at last mile delivery, unless you actually have warehouses that are closer to cities and built vertically, <clears throat> you're not going to have three hours, six hour or same day uh, delivery. On top of that, more people are on, during COVID are online, they're on their computer. So what's that mean? More data is, being shared, more data is being sent and received. Uh, data storage facilities are a large part of the REIT portfolio. The cloud is not in the sky, it's in buildings <laughs> with servers, with floors and floors of more servers. And when you look at that, you uh, basically see that, uh, for me personally, there's an opportunity to kind of describe the way in which technology is transforming real estate. And I go back to the point of uh, it's incumbent upon us to have that that niche area wherever we're working on to really focus on our on our craft. So that's something that I like to speak to and I enjoy writing about and working within the world of REITs, uh, Real Estate Investment Trust, because it's such a diverse uh, portfolio. Uh, I have many different areas to touch and most importantly, educate uh, people about and to kind of describe how real estate is all around us in any way. And much like every single field in the American economy today or the world uh, economy is being tra transformed. And so what might have taken 10 or 15 years, uh, the, you know, the tragedy of, of COVID has basically accelerated that change, some for the good, some for the bad. Um, so I think uh, it goes back to that, that original point with uh, understanding that 
in many cases, uh, Moses and myself and other uh, African Americans like us are going to be seen um, as anomalies um, in the spaces that we're in, the real estate uh, environments and spaces that we're in, while at the same time, there's also opportunity, great opportunities uh, for us as well. Uh, that's great, John. that's great. And I think when you were talking, you know, you, you touched on uh, a couple of things that, you know, I wanted to address uh, as well. And I think maybe um, technology might be the answer to uh, some of one of these, th this issue in particular. Um, and what it is, is essentially, you know, when I, when I think back to when I was coming up, um, entering the uh, commercial real estate industry was like not even something I contemplated. Um, I thought that, you know, you needed to be a billionaire if you wanted to be somehow involved in commercial real estate. Because how could little old me, who was on free lunch when I was in high school, get into commercial real estate where you're talking about tens and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars, um, you know, for properties and whatnot. And, and I think it's unfortunate because I think in our community far too often, our, our opportunities are limited by, you know, the circumstances of the world, no doubt, but by us simply because we don't have the concept or the perception that we can do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's just not in front of us. It just doesn't look real. We don't know anybody in that industry. And so, you know, the question I have, and we'll start with you, Moses, is how can we change that perception? You know, how do we show minorities, African-Americans, um, that working in this industry is an option? And to me, I feel like, you know, I definitely want to hear it in the real estate context, but I think the answer that you'll give probably applies to a large number of industries um, in terms of African Americans having some of the better opportunities. Um, so Moses, if you wouldn't mind just kind of commenting on how- Yeah, would you yeah. I have a more of a boots on the ground approach on that type of uh, question. Like John has mentioned, I've gone into the elementary schools, the high schools, and I talk to black and brown young boys and girls to inspire them. I've even gone to the juvenile detention centers to talk to these young men and women about the opportunities in commercial real estate. And you know, the crazy part is you'll be surprised. They are interested. They have a passion. They have a hunger. You should see how many hands and questions go up as soon as I finish my, my spiel and talk, that they, they want to learn. But I, like you said, it's about a lack of exposure. And I think when you can show that there are so many aspects of commercial real estate that you can lead a comfortable lifestyle, I think that's kind of the goal of a lot of our parents in terms of getting an education and so that we can, quote unquote, live the American dream. And so when you can show them that, okay, yeah, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an athlete, you can be a singer, but also you can be a commercial real estate professional and operate in a very successful path. And so to your point, I think it's about creating programs that, you know, um, adds to the curriculum early on, you know, when we can talk about real estate and stuff in elementary, high schools, and that prepares them for college programs. And like you said, the HBCUs where they have programs and scholarships for people in commercial real estate. So I think, like you said, I have more of a ground, boots on the grounds approach on this. It's just about the messaging and social media. We have to reach people where they're at. I think the use of the internet and having conversations like this is very important. So maybe someone may, you know, come across this and want to share it with their nephew and say, hey, here are some young black men are in this industry and are thriving. This is something you should think about. So I, I think once we can show that commercial real estate can provide a certain lifestyle and uh, different opportunities, I think it will entice others to get into the field. And so that, that's kind of my thought process on it. And I think we also need other larger corporations to help in getting that message across, not just, like you said, just having a, a person on just for a diversity count, but actually adding, what are you actually doing in the community? What programs have you done? What scholarships have you created? What monetary 
value have you, you know, given to these communities to help people get into the field? So I think that's important as well. Uh, thank you, Moses. I think that is great. John, love to hear kind of what you have on that topic in terms of, um, you know, how do we change these perceptions? How do we teach, um, you know, young African-American uh, 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 young men and young women that, you know, there's options out there for them and, and real estate's one of them. Sure, we have to uh, stress the importance of the successful models that we have out there in terms of commercial real estate. You know, with uh, Moses uh, highlighting the fact that he's from Chicago, I can't help but think about uh, Jesse Binga, who uh, in this day and age would have been a multimillionaire, but the south side of Chicago was uh, once home to the famous uh, Black Belt, and Jesse Bingo was one of, the, in the early 1900s, was one of the most successful real estate owners in the United States as an African American, uh, notwithstanding the challenges that were there today. Uh, and the Black Belt in Chicago was seen as the the uh, capital of a uh, Black capital and ownership uh, in the world at that time. So I think there are. A, a number of success stories that we can share and also um, helping to reestablish that pride of ownership in the African-American community when it comes to land and when it comes <clears throat> when it comes to property and how the role of ownership, uh, how, the, how significant the role of ownership is as it pertains to empowerment. And uh, when looking at issues like that, I think it's very important to stress what are, in many ways, these success stories. And also, we have to talk about access to capital. And it's very important um, for whether it's companies, white or black, and customers, um, African-American or non-African-American, to push the importance of supporting and utilizing African-American-owned banks. Because in many uh, situations, it will be African-American-owned banking institutions who are going to provide the capital to African-American uh, potential real estate investors, um, number two. And then number three, it's going to be uh, very important as we look at uh, the opportunities that are out there. In many cases, you hear the uh, idea of uh, buy the block. Well, that's going to be extremely important going forward as especially as the challenges as it pertains to uh, upward mobility and economic sense are only going to get more challenging going forward. Real estate provides that the significant opportunities out there. In many cases, you can see uh, literally an, uh, and, and, you know, a person who immigrates to America with nothing but the shirt on their back rise and succeed in real estate. And so we have to ask what can be done in the African-American community to replicate those same strategies that were utilized to rise in real estate. And a lot of that's going to come down to education, <clears throat> uh, access to capital, and number three, ensuring that there is pressure to push corporations, uh, especially within the world of real estate, to hire and give and provide opportunities for African Americans. Uh, within the real estate space, whether that's uh, pushing companies to implement a Rooney rule to ensure that any senior position that is opening, that an African-American is interviewed for that position and giving the opportunity, or whether it's uh, pushing companies to utilize, um, to utilize opportunities uh, for African-American vendors to actually interview and apply for contracting opportunities uh, with corporations as well. Because at the end of the day, people aren't looking for a handout. They're looking for a fair shot. And too often African-American um, uh, you know, employees, vendors, and small business owners have been denied that fair shot. And I think that's what people are calling for, uh, especially today, when you look at, especially right now as it pertains to uh, what has happened since the tragic killing of uh, George Floyd, and you see the protest and unrest around the country, many, many people are calling for a fair shot and equal opportunity, uh, whether it's in the world of criminal justice, police reform, healthcare, education, 
or especially economic empowerment. That makes sense to me. Um, you know, I think that you guys have been uh, great today. I will say on a number of occasions and John, you just did it again. You know, you have good panelists. I've moderated lots of these things before. You know, you have good panelists when they lead you into your next question, <laughs> because uh, you, that means that you're all clicking on the same page and, and, and know what some of the important things are. So, you know, my, you know, one of the questions I have is I know we need help in all these areas. And as we wind down, um, is it resources? Is it connecting people to those resources? Like where, where, where do we think the, the big hole is right now? Is it that we need to get more money and more programs? Do we need to get the people in the programs? I'll say, you know, it's, it's twofold. It's multifaceted, but you know, starting from the top, you do have African-Americans who work in real estate, have been uh, successful in real estate, but in a Entity in, in, in an industry where so much relies on networks and uh, family relationships, those opportunities uh, to advance in too many cases have been stymied. And I do think, at least in terms of our member companies, that we have more uh, companies looking at uh, those challenges today. Some, you know, organically, and some because they realize the challenges of the times where it's incumbent upon them to step up and do it. Also to you on, you know, you have institutional investors putting pressure on companies as just as they do as it pertains to what they're doing, what companies are doing on climate mitigation and ASG. Now you have more institutional investors asking companies, what are you doing in terms of the racial diversity space? Um, and then, you know, the, sec the second part is I would say it is important to highlight the value of investing uh, in the pipeline. And so it's important that uh, companies and professionals within the real estate space are looking at fellowship and internship opportunities to bring in African-American students to work uh, for real estate companies. And not just to work and get the two or six months in internship, but to get the externships that can actually lead to careers uh, with those companies or with other companies. So I think we have to work to highlight the stars um, that we already have in the industry to promote, to elevate them to the opportunity that they, that they already could take on today, or at the same time, ensuring that we have more African Americans coming in as interns and taking advantage of fellowships within um, the real estate industry. Absolutely. Uh, Moses, I'm going to ask you the same question, you know, resources or connecting people to resources, understanding there's problems in both, but which one do you see? And then um, after you answer that, if you could give us some closing remarks, um, it's been a great conversation. I think we could probably talk about this for hours and keep going, um, but we only have uh, the 50 minutes. So if you could just answer that and give us uh, some closing remarks, something somebody could take away today. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that we educate the African-American community. I think that's kind of where we are falling at um, in terms of, I know John had mentioned earlier about by the block. There are a lot of opportunities where someone's grandma, grandpa owned a three flat on the block for years, no mortgage, no nothing. They pass away, no estate planning, no life insurance, uh, you know, the grandchildren have been living there free. free. They, they, they don't want to pay someone and told them they ain't got to pay the taxes. And they lose this property that has equity and lose it to a tax sale. And then now that property goes into foreclosure. Then you have three, four homes on the same block and now our neighborhoods are blighted. So I think we need to educate our community about the power of ownership it so that we can build our communities together. And like you said, education about uh, an exposure about the commercial real estate field. So reaching back. So like people like me and John, reaching back to other uh, others that are interested in this field and just kind of guiding them and giving them resources and tools in order to elevate. I think that's important. So I think, as you kind of mentioned, it goes hand in hand. And so for my closing remarks, you know, I think we need to continue these conversations but I also think we also need to have an action plan. 
so that these conversations don't continue because there is, there is not a lack of diversity. And so I think it's about uh, co collaborating with other institutions and reaching back to our communities and helping building the pipeline of the next generation of young professionals. So that's kind of where, what my takeaway is, I want people to take away is we, we need education, we need resources, we need access to capital. And with the combination of these things, I think we can defeat and overcome the lack of diversity in commercial real estate. That's great. John, really quick, can you, you wanna give us uh, some closing statements? Sure, much, much, absolutely. Thanks, Quincy. Much to Moses, uh, Moses's point, I think the challenge, and I think we've pretty, we've pretty much done a good job of that today, is uh, our all of our discussions at some point should end with being uh, solutions driven. And I think Moses and I, you, Quincy, we highlighted some of those points today. And at the same time, I, I'll get back to the point that those of us who are in this industry have to work on continuing to be masters of our craft, much like Moses is. I work in the world of REITs, real estate investment trusts. Um, you know, when I, I point out to folks all the time in the, in the community, when you look at that Dollar General, when you look at that AutoZone, when you look at the Burger King, those companies in many cases, they don't own those uh, properties that they operate, operate in. They are tenants. They pay money every month to the landlord. And the REITs, that's who we represent. We represent the landlords. These are publicly held real estate companies. When you're a landlord, you have to, in many cases, worry about the toilet, the taxes, and the trash. But when you can invest in a REIT, you're investing in publicly held real estate companies that are on the stock exchange. So you can get your investment cashed out every month through dividends, right? And that's something that I work to encourage and educate people about the ownership opportunities that exist in real estate. As Moses said, and we highlighted earlier, that, uh, that opportunity to really buy the block and buy the ownership, invest in the ownership opportunities in your own community. And I think as we continue to point to that solution of the ability and the power of ownership, I think some of these challenges will start to recede, recede whether they're economic or political. That's wonderful. Really appreciate you both. Uh, just want to thank you both for being on the panel again. Um, I think we really cover some important ground. We got some information out there that could um, help break down some of the barriers that we saw and give people a better understanding for what the industry looks like. Um, you know, in closing, I, I just want to thank everybody watching uh, for joining us for this great uh, conversation. There's clearly a lot of work to do, but having the realtors and NARI committed uh, to the issue is critical to improving diversity in the commercial real estate market. And I want to thank both the organizations for the leadership they continue to show on the issue of diversity. They've stepped up in a major way and I'm looking forward to see what's to come because I know they're not done yet. Uh, as a reminder, uh, the session will be archived and available from the CBCF through the end of the year. So if you know someone that would be interested in the panel, please spread the word. Uh, everyone, you have a great afternoon and uh, we hope that you've been able to get some great information from this session.